All right, so there is a, a number of structure of chemical synapses that you need to be aware of. Uh, first, we have the presynaptic membrane, and this would be the end of the axon. Next, we have the postsynaptic membrane, and this would be the dendrite or spine or the cell body that is receiving the signal from the preceding neuron. And then you have the synaptic cleft, which is the space between. So the presynaptic membrane is where the action potential terminates to release the chemical message. So the presynaptic membrane is sending the message. The postsynaptic membrane is the receiving side, okay? So this postsynaptic um, membrane would be receiving a message that would result in an EPSP or an IPSP. The synaptic cleft is the space between that has to travel from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic membrane. So if you order, um, if uh, you have a valentine, it's getting close to Valentine's Day, so if um, your mom or your significant other it sends you a valentine, okay? The person that is sending the valentine is the presynaptic membrane. The person that is receiving the valentine is the postsynaptic membrane. The synaptic cleft is the space between you. Now there are a couple other elements that are important for the uh, structure of chemical synapses and how neurotransmitters are sent. So one is that, or number four I would say, is that you have a synaptic vesicle. And this occurs on the presynaptic side. So this is small membrane-bound spheres that can carry, can, that carry the neurotransmitters. Then you also have storage granules. These are also at the presynaptic side. These are membrane compartments that hold several vesicles containing the neurotransmitter. And then you have the postsynaptic receptor, the site to which a neurotransmitter molecule binds. So if I were to continue with my somewhat silly Valentine analogy, the synaptic vesicle, um, the small membrane-bound sphere that contains the neurotransmitter, would basically be like the envelope that um, your Valentine is in. Okay, the storage granule membrane compartment that holds several several vesicles. Um, maybe your mom has, um, you have siblings, and so she's sending out multiple Valentines. So she'll hold hold those multiple Valentines in a compartment basically to get them ready for release. Uh, and then you have the postsynaptic receptor. To what does your valentine bind? You could just say your hand. So here's an example. You have your axon. This in the end is your um, axon terminal. Here are the synaptic vesicles. Inside each of these are neurotransmitters. And you can almost see them, little tiny, tiny little dots. This space here is the synaptic cleft, so it's really quite small. And if you were to not look too closely, it would look like the two are actually physically connected, but they're not. There is a space between. So this is the presynaptic, and this is the postsynaptic, okay? This here would be, uh, for example, a dendritic spine. All right, so one thing that I want to make clear is that neurons are interconnected and they can uh, have feedback loops, they can form uh, larger interconnected structures. Whatever neuron is sending the message is presynaptic, and whatever neuron is receiving the message is postsynaptic. So the important thing to realize is that at one time, a neuron can be receiving a message that then will give rise to an EPSP that would stimulate it to send its own message. First it would be sending, and then it would be presynaptic, and then it could be receiving, in which case it would be postsynaptic. So any neuron, just depending on whether it is receiving or sending a message. If it is sending a message, it is presynaptic. If it is receiving a message, it is postsynaptic. And here's another sort of larger example where you can see um, more of how the cleft is in here, um, the neurotransmitters that would be released. These are the microtubules that uh, the vesicles would travel down. And here is a synaptic vesicle. This is a large storage granule, so this is where you could have a couple of them that are all held together. This is your presynaptic membrane, and here's your synaptic cleft. And so what happens is uh, 
the action potential travels down and it's going to stimulate, we'll talk about this in a little bit um, later on in this chapter, it's going to stimulate the release of these neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft via exocytosis. And once these neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic um, membrane, they will be received at this postsynaptic membrane on these receptors. And once these receptors are stimulated, they can then have let ions into the cell that would, again, result in an IPSP or an EPSP that um, would then continue to send its message. So now you have a little bit of the basics about neurotransmitters, and we're going to go more in depth at this point. So here is neurotransmission in four major steps. So one, the neurotransmitter must be synthesized and stored in the axon terminal. Okay, So it can either be made in the axon terminal, synthesized, or it will be made in the cell body and will be stored there. But it basically has to be ready for release in some fashion. Two, it can be transported to the presynaptic membrane and released in response to an action potential. So it's there, it's stored, and then it needs to basically move closer to the presynaptic membrane at which point it will be released into the action potential. Three, the neurotransmitter must be able to activate receptors on the target cell located on the postsynaptic membrane. So neurotransmitters are paired with the receptor cells on the postsynaptic membrane. It's a bit of a lock and key relationship. So the cell is only going to release neurotransmitters that are meant to connect to those receptors. The cell wouldn't potentially release tons of different keys that would not fit in any of the locks on the other side. Now a neurotransmitter will work indefinitely in the synaptic cleft if it is not inactivated and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So a neurotransmitter, once it's released into the synaptic cleft, has the potential to continually activate receptors unless it is inactivated through a variety of mechanisms. All right, so now we're going to go into these major steps in more detail. So step one is synthesis and storage. So if they are synthesized in the axon terminal, that means that building blocks from food are pumped into the cell via transporters. These are transporters or protein molecules that are embedded within the cell membrane. So the food that we eat forms the building blocks for constructing the neurotransmitters that we need for cellular communication. So this is one of the principal, principal reasons why what we eat can actually affect our behavior. If we don't eat sufficient um, nutrients that give us the types of nutrients that our body needs to construct neurotransmitters and essential neurotransmitters, then it can affect our mood or our behavior because we can have a shortage of some of the neurotransmitters that we would need. So we have the synthesis and the axon terminal. Um, alternately, the neurotransmitter can be synthesized in the cell body. And if it's synthesized in cell body, it would be uh, constructed according to instructions contained in the DNA. And so this is what we went into a little bit of depth last chapter when we would talk about how the DNA would unzip and they would make a copy through this messenger RNA. And then this messenger RNA would be used to give instructions for the ribosomes and the mitochondria to create proteins. And that these proteins would be constructed of uh, amino acid chains. So those amino acid chains that, can, that comprise proteins can be made in the cell body uh, via instructions from the DNA. And those can... Uh, be used as neurotransmitters that would be, again, in that way they would be synthesized in the cell body and then they would actually be transported down those microtubules to the axon terminal for them to be released. And again here, these microtubules will be translated down and uh, so you can have these two ways that they would be transported down or 
the precursor chemicals would be in the extracellular fluid. They would be let into the body by these uh, transporters that would be used to synthesize neurotransmitters here at the axon terminal. Then these would be packaged into these vesicles that would prepare them for release. And it's important because these vesicles have a membrane that basically merges with the membrane here. And so only through these uh, vesicles can they be released into the synaptic cleft. All right, so step two, neurotransmitter release. At the terminal, once you have these neurotransmitters that are in vesicles that are ready, that have the potential to be released, the action potential, once it travels down um, the axon, at the axon terminal, the action potential opens voltage-sensitive calcium channels. These voltage-sensitive calcium channels let calcium into the axon terminal. And once this calcium enters, it binds to the protein calmodium. This calmodulin forms a complex that takes part in two chemical reactions. So one, it releases vesicles bound to the presynaptic membrane. The vesicles then empty their contents into the synaptic cleft through a process of excitosis. And two, it releases vesicles bound to microfilaments on the axon terminal. So these vesicles released from the filaments then move up to replace the vesicles that just emptied their contents. You should start to see some themes in terms of that these cells operate on these concentration gradients and these voltage sensitive gradients. So the same action potential, this positive um, uh, positivity that travels down the action potential, once it release, once that reaches here at the end, then what it does, this action potential just doesn't, you know, like, oh, just travels down the axon. No, once it reaches the end, it, the action potential stimulates the release of these neurotransmitters. And here's how it does it. So when it gets to this end, this positivity opens these voltage sensitive terminals, okay? They let the calcium in. So it's the same process, you know, up on the dendrites in the cell body, you're gonna have voltage sensitive channels that let sodium in. Now here, you're also gonna have voltage sensitive channels that let calcium in. The incoming calcium binds to the calmodulin and it forms this complex right here. And this calmodulin needs the calcium to, to basically have the correct structure. Once it has this correct structure, then it binds to these vesicles, releasing some from filaments and inducing others to bind to the presynaptic membrane and empty their contents. Once these neurotransmitters come out, then they connect with the receptors here and will then have an EPSP or IPSP effect on the postsynaptic membrane. So now we have our third step, which is receptor site activation. The neurotransmitter will diffuse across the synaptic cleft. Again, remember that the neurotransmitter is going from a point of higher concentration right when it's released and it goes from this high concentration to diffuses out to where there's lower concentration. And this would diffuse out across the synaptic cleft. So these transmitter activated receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, they receive the neurotransmitter. At the point of reception, this will create a depolarizing effect, which would be an EPSP, or a hyperpolarizing effect, which would be an IPSP. So if you would have a depolarizing effect, then it would be encouraging the neuron to fire. And if you have a hyperpolarizing effect, it would be trying to prevent the neuron from firing. Then you also have transmitter activated receptors on the presynaptic membrane that are known as autoreceptors. And these provide feedback to the presynaptic neuron, okay? And it will basically, in the form that it provides negative feedback, that it will tell it to stop releasing neurotransmitters, for example, or that it's releasing too many neurotransmitters. These autoreceptors are really, really important in elements of uh, common habituation and um, sensitization and desensitization that are hallmark features of drug addiction.
So we have our third step. The transmitter is received and it binds to a receptor and it will cause an EPSP or an IPSP. In our fourth step, we have to deactivate the neurotransmitter. Recall that the neurotransmitter will function indefinitely unless it is removed from the synapse. So the deactivation of a neurotransmitter is accomplished in at least four ways. One, it simply diffuses away from the synaptic cleft. That only in the synaptic cleft are there these receptors. So if it diffuses out of the synaptic cleft and basically just floats into the extracellular fluid, then there are not uh, receptors to receive it and uh, it will cease to have a, an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. Two, you also have degradation by enzymes in the synaptic cleft. So there are actual enzymes, little molecules, in the synaptic cleft and they break apart the and degrade the neurotransmitters that enter the synaptic cleft. So this is also one way that the neurotransmitters don't continue to act indefinitely. In order for neurons to communicate only when they want to communicate, then you have to clean up any excess uh, chemicals left. Otherwise, they'll keep on uh, trying to activate the postsynaptic neuron, even when they shouldn't. An additional way is that the neurotransmitters can actually be picked up and taken back into the presynaptic neuron for subsequent reuse. This is called reuptake. So if you were to reuptake neurotransmitters for subsequent use, uh, reuptake would be a basic form of recycling and the reuptake mechanism is also something that is often targeted by drugs the most common example being SSRIs, which are a real common drug, drug type for depression or uh, some aspects of bipolar disorder. And these SSRIs stand for serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So if you were to inhibit reuptake, then that would mean that you would you would try to stop the neuron from removing the neurotransmitter from the synapse. And so the, syn the neurotransmitters that would release would actually be left in the synapse for a longer period of time to increase their effect on the postsynaptic membrane. The SSRIs try to target um, a shortage of serotonin. So if an individual has a shortage of serotonin, then if you try to inhibit reuptake, then you can try to address that shortage by basically leaving the serotonin in the synapse for longer but you have to be really careful because it can be, this can be affect the release of neurotrans of serotonin uh, in multiple, multiple pathways in the brain, which can of course give rise to side effects. And the final way that neurotransmitters are relieved from the synaptic, are removed from the synaptic cleft is that they are taken up by neighboring glial cells. Glial cells are often involved in cleanup and can also take in some of the neurotransmitters for to break down as molecules that, that, that the glial cell may in fact use. And again, here's the final step of inactivation. The neurotransmitter is, is either taken back into the axon terminal, right through here, so that it can be used, or it can be diffusing out of the synaptic cleft after it's been broken down. So there's multiple ways that it can be removed.